Hi, I'm Tony Rialli, Director of Photography at Creative Edge Productions and Educator at Next Wave DV. I've been working with Kessler Crane Gear for over 10 years now, everything from their jibs, their dollies, sliders, uh, and of course their motion control system. It has been a huge asset for us to have on set. Um, because of the, uh, the quick setup, uh, ease of use, and the modularity of the system. And we've been using it a lot lately with our virtual production studio setup that you're looking at right now. Uh, virtual production is an amazing tool that's quickly becoming really popular in Hollywood, and it's starting to trickle its way down to independent productions. Uh, in Hollywood productions, you'll typically see them using large LED walls that are huge and, and very, very expensive. And so for us, we wanted to figure out a way to do it that would be uh, more inexpensive, uh, able to be fit in our, into our studio space and something that we can incorporate into uh, productions that we feel it could benefit from. And we've used it across music videos, across tabletop shoots. There's been a lot of things that we've been able to incorporate it with. And using Kessler Gear has been a great tool for that as well. So what is virtual production? Well, simply put, virtual production is the use of digital assets in real time. So some people use it uh, with green screen setups where they will use camera tracking data and then live, posi live position the camera. Uh, instead of having to use tracking mar markers and, and trying to track that in post-production, uh, you can do it all in real time and even see it potentially in camera. Uh, but green screen still has limitations. So being able to do it in camera camera VFX, which is what you're looking at right here. I actually have a 4K projector behind me. It's a 150 inch screen. And we're using Unreal Engine to live track and live render the image that's behind me. The reason that we're doing live tracking and, and live rendering is because the camera is able to move and change perspective behind me. So like obviously the screen is only a few feet behind me, but because of the parallax that's happening in the camera tracking data in, in Unreal Engine, it feels like there's a lot more depth to this scene. And that is just an amazing tool to have. I can do in-camera VFX, I can do things that are typically not, uh, not able to be done with green screen. So for example, I'm using a Promis filter on the camera right now. Typically you don't want to do that with green screen. There's a, a lot of effects uh, lighting that's kind of bleeding into the frame, a little bit of blooming that's happening at your frame. All that kind of stuff would be a nightmare with green screen. But with in-camera VFX, it's really, really easy. I can also shoot very, very shallow depth of field, so I don't have to worry about getting a very crisp edge around me. Uh, I can shoot more naturally like I would when I'm shooting on a regular production in a real environment. So today I wanna to talk about our setup, how we got it up and running, and how we use Kessler Synod Shooter with that setup. So first and foremost, we're using a 4K projector. This is a Samsung ultra short throw projector, and the advantage to using an ultra short throw projector is the ability to get it just a few inches away from the screen. So for a 150 inch screen, this projector is sitting right behind me, you know, a little over a foot away. And that is amazing because I can then stand directly in front of it and not have the beam hitting me in the face. For the screen material, we're using ambient light rejecting or ALR screen material, which allows uh, a lot of the ambient light to not reflect off of it. It still is important though, to try and minimize the screen spill uh, from the uh, available lighting that we're using on the talent. So uh, all my lights, I have some sort of a grid on those lights. Uh, that way I can direct it. I also have right off camera here, a uh, four by four floppy that I can use to try and also keep the light off of the screen. It's very important because if you get too much light on the screen, you start to bring up that black floor because the black of the projector can only be as dark as the ambient light of the room. So you wanna keep that black level as, as uh, deep and dark as possible so that you can still maintain good black levels in your, your scenario and then it doesn't feel too washed out and too feel too fake behind you. In addition to wanting to be able to have control over your lighting, you're also gonna to wanna to be able to have control over the color. When you're working with a projector system like this, or maybe an LED wall or TV, typically they have a white balance of the LEDs on this, the, uh, the panel or the, the projector bulb is typically around daylight, you know, that, that five to 6,000 degree Kelvin range. You can sometimes warm it up. Uh, there'll be settings in, in your display that might allow you to warm it up, but for the most part, you're typically gonna be working in that daylight range. It's never gonna be in a full tungsten range. So you're gonna need bulbs that are daylight balanced. Uh, but if you're wanting to say like an environment like this, where this is kind of a very blue environment, you can't go more daylight or more blue than daylight. So then you might wanna be working with RGB lights. So some of the panels I have next to me and the ones overhead are RGB panels and I can dial in uh, the additional blue that I might need depending on the color of the environment around you. Obviously you're wanting to make sure that you have 
as much uh, similarity of your lighting as you do with what's behind you. So you'll notice that I have the light coming from my right, camera left. Um, that is motivated because the windows are to my right, camera left. Um, I'm making sure that I, I kind of have different layers of lighting. I have the main soft light, and then I can have a, have a harder edge light, and that's giving me that look of like window light kind of hitting me on the side. And then obviously if I was lighting this room for an interview, I'd probably have a main key light over here. So I'm motivating my lighting based upon what I see in the environment and trying to get it all to match. So best practices of getting your lighting to match is, is probably where you spend most of your time. And honestly, that's where I spent most of my time when getting this set up. The cine shooter was actually the fastest thing to set up. The longer thing was getting all the lighting dialed in as best as possible. Um, and there are color grading things that you can do in Unreal Engine, and sometimes that's the easier thing to do, is to try and dial it in. The temptation sometimes is by having full control over your, uh, your environment that you can be like, oh, mate, let's get the windows so that they are completely dialed in and let's get our, our blacks raised up and let's, you know, like, let's dial it in. But the problem is that if you do too much of that, it starts to look fake. I want the window to blow out a little bit. I want there to be some imperfections in there because that's what it would be if it was natural. So things like that, you don't, I don't want me to be so bright, to be overlit, that I'm brighter than a window behind me. There's no way that that would ever happen. You know, I could ND gel down a window in a real life, but uh, you know, it's gonna start to look a little fake if I try to do that in a digital environment. So those are some be best practices that you can do to try and get your, uh, your talent or environment lighting to match that of your digital environment behind you. A couple other best practices are you want to make sure that the screen is bright. If it's too dim, it'll give away the effect that it's a screen behind you. So sometimes that means, you know, you can only get the projector as bright as it goes. So I'm shooting in the FX6, which has really good low light capabilities. And that allows me to uh, you know, bump up the ISO and let the screen get as bright as possible. It actually means that my lighting can be fairly dim. Uh, in the environment that I'm in, it's actually pretty dark, uh, and which is also important to kind of black out the environment as much as you can to get that light control. Also shooting on the FX6, we're shooting at 24p, not 2398, but 24p with 144 degree shutter. And this is, uh, allows us to not get any banding um, or strobing effects on the projector screen. Now the great thing about Unreal Engine is it's free to get started with. It's free to download and install on your computer. And in Unreal Engine Marketplace, there's a ton of free stuff that you can download as well. Lots of assets that are made available. Uh, and even monthly, you can download new assets that are available each month. So if you're interested in this at all, I would definitely check out the Unreal Engine Marketplace and just start adding them to your cart every month. I have a little reminder on my phone that tells me, hey, go check out the Unreal Engine and just add those items to my cart because it's typically a few hundred dollars worth of free assets available each month. Now, the truth is I'm not gonna get into the, the in-depth of how to use Unreal Engine. There's a lot of great tutorials online that are can be anywhere from a uh, half hour to five, 10 hours of training. So I highly recommend if you're interested in learning Unreal Engine, start there, find a great tutorial from somebody that knows what they're doing because it's really important to learn the basic navigation of Unreal. The nice thing though about the free assets, including the one that's sitting behind me, is that you can quickly load those up and if you know the basics of navigating around, uh, you know, just using the basic UI, uh, you can be up and running really quickly. So we went from going from not knowing anything about Unreal to being completely up and running with camera tracking, the projector, everything running in just a matter of a few weeks. And that was doing it maybe a couple hours a week of just uh, working at it, learning the system and slowly getting it up and running. So once you get Unreal Engine up and running and you're familiar with the user interface, the way to get the entire image directly behind you and to fill the screen is using a plugin called End Display. An end display is what basically uses uh, an in-camera, in-engine camera as a porthole to display then on your screen. Again, there's lots of tutorials online on how to set that up. The reason I don't want to talk about it in here is because uh, Unreal Engine is constantly changing. We're using 4.27 right now, uh, but with 5.1 coming out soon, uh, there's going to be a lot of updates that are going to uh, improve virtual production uh, and possibly change the way things are done. So I highly recommend check out online tutorials because things are constantly evolving. But the process is you're basically telling uh, the Unreal Engine and the End Display plugin what the size of your screen is, what the height of it is, the width of it, the height off of the ground, and the distance from the camera. And the way that we figure out what the camera position is, is using camera tracking data through what we use for our camera tracker is the HTC Vive system. Uh, the HTC Vive tracker is very inexpensive, 
Basically, if you have a HTC Vive or a Valve Index already, you have most of the hardware necessary to be up and running. So to set up your HTC Vive, you would go through the normal process of setting up Steam VR, setting up the Vive, uh, setting up your lighthouses like you would in a regular VR headset, and then you're gonna use the headset initially the very first time to, to set a zero point of where everything is in relation. Uh, I have an X marked on our floor for that, but that zero point then says, all right, from this zero point, this is where the screen is in relation to the camera and all that kind of stuff. Now the camera after that can be moved around, but that zero point is necessary for getting everything kind of a baseline of where your tracking will work off of that. Now after that, the, the headset, we just kind of leave it off in the corner. We don't use that for anything else in this setup. Uh, the main thing that we then use is the HTC Vive tracker. So that is set on top of the camera and we make sure that it is in clear line of sight to the lighthouse uh, infrared lasers. And then with that, uh, as the camera moves around, that tracking data through LiveLink is then interpreted as the uh, camera positional data for how it is then projected on end display. So as the camera moves, end display is, is re-rendering that position in, in real effect, in real time uh, on the background behind me. So if I didn't have the tracker working, you would get very a flat look. You know, the, the image would stay static and as the camera moves, it would reveal the fact that there isn't, this the screen's only a few feet behind me. But with having the Vive tracker, the engine renders that background in real time. So it is important to have a fairly beefy computer to run this on because you're gonna be basically doing high resolution uh, rendering in real time. The nice thing though is that if you, you know, if you keep doing uh, HD, you don't need to have 4K necessarily on the screen behind you. You can run it in, in HD, which is actually what we're doing because typically you're gonna to wanna to throw it out of focus a little bit. Just keeping the background slightly out of focus helps to minimize any of the aliasing that you might have from the pixelation. On a projector, it's less noticeable, but definitely on like LED walls and stuff like that, it can be a problem. So just trying to keep the background under the back, best practice is to keep the background slightly out of focus. There are times where you might wanna keep it in focus and that's okay, but there'll be some experimentation that you might need to do to make sure that uh, you're not getting any, any weird artifacts happening in the camera. You know, I've seen some systems that, uh, where you, the motion control system directly integrates to, into Unreal Engine and you can basically take your, your uh, motion control data and it renders that in the background and you don't you need to use camera trackers like the Vive Tracker. That's a nice system, but the, the advantage to using the Vive Tracker is that we're not reliant on being on the, uh, the Kessler CineShooter system. Obviously I'm using it right now and we're getting that proper camera tracking happening in the background. But I can quickly take the camera off of the, uh, the Cine Shooter head. I can go handheld, I can just, you know, I can go on sticks, I can go whatever I need to and I've already have this set up. So having this completely up and running, I can switch cameras, I can switch any sort of setup uh, and it's very, very easy to, to get going. The initial setup takes a little bit but once we have it set up, uh, we can be up and running uh, on new sets, new locations behind us very, very quickly. Uh, we've been doing tons of different types of productions where you gotta be nimble, you gotta be moving around quickly. And so uh, being able to take the camera, change the position, change the setup, switch from a dolly to a jib, to sliders, to handheld, to whatever it may be, um, this just works the best for us. One of my favorite additions to the Cine Shooter is the addition of the roll axis. Um, this makes it really easy to set up camera moves that are not perfectly level. Um, you'll notice here that we, we kind of have the camera slightly, uh, the, the dolly track slightly uh, tilted up. Um, and this uh, allows me to kind of do something much more dynamic than just a traditional back and forth. Uh, I have the camera kind of positioned so that as it's dollying, uh, to the camera left, it's also moving a little bit closer to me and it's raised up. Um, and then as it dollies back, it's a little bit further away from me uh, and it is a bit uh, further down. So this combination allows me to kind of move gently into more of a medium close up back to more of a slightly wider shot. And uh, the roll axis allows me to easily position that and make sure that the camera is properly level uh, in that camera move without having to have any additional attachments and hardware. Well, when I've done this with other times, I had to add a, a extra module in there to level out the camera 
this is a lot easier to set up. And it allows us to do really cool, complicated moves. Uh, we did uh, a cool tabletop shoot recently where the camera was able to spin around in really dynamic ways. And using the screen behind us, we were able to uh, set it up with a bunch of different environments. We had one where it was for a sneaker shoot, so we had it uh, in, a, in a basketball court environment. Um, and then we used a bunch of digital uh, backdrops, just stuff that we found on, on Bottle Elements, and we threw them up on the background and it gave us something really cool to work with. The virtual production in that shoot gave us the option to do things that we just typically couldn't do on a green screen shoot. Uh, we used smoke, we used, uh, had highly reflective services. We did a lot of things that if you were working in a green screen, you'd never want to do. You'd never want to use smoke. You never want to have uh, something reflective because as soon as the green reflects off of it, your key is going to be all over the place. You, working with a, a game engine using Unreal Engine, you can do things. You can add, uh, add snow to a scene. In fact, uh, we've done a couple experiments where we've worked with uh, using a snow machine that actually had the snow fall da falling down and we were able to do that right in camera. Again, typically that would be very, very difficult to do in a green screen. You'd have to add that in digitally and you wouldn't get the level of interaction um, that you would prefer to have uh, right in camera where you have the different layers and the depths of it. We even had our talent interacting with the snow a little bit. So being able to shoot that directly in camera is just a really great tool to have. Kessel's done a great job of ticking all the boxes that you might have when it comes to motion control. So whether it's time lapse, um, you know, repeatable moves, uh, stop motion, um, even event shooting and that kind of stuff, uh, I really love that CineShooter kind of covers all those bases. And then from an interface standpoint, you've got a ton of options. You can uh, just simply set it up with uh, the on uh, head controls. The, the, the directional pad on the back of it makes it really, really fast and easy to set up. Uh, and, and when I was doing this shoot, I was able to do it very, very quick. But then if you want to get more depth, there's an app on your phone that gives you more options, more keyframes, uh, more setup choices. Uh, you can use a PS4 controller, which uh, has been a lot of fun to be able to uh, control all the axes just with a touch of a button. And then when you're ready to step up to having uh, a much more detailed and much more robust control system, there's the Chaos software, which we've used with CineDrive for years, and I'm so glad to see it uh, available on CineShooter because uh, there are times where you want to really get in and define and lay out uh, keyframes, especially when you're dealing with, with focus. Uh, focus isn't always a straight one to two keyframe. Sometimes you have to ramp it up uh, depending on your lens. So having the, the Bezier curves available in the Chaos software allow you to get perfect, perfect focus. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video to be a great introduction to Unreal Engine and virtual production. For more information on the CineShooter motion control platform and other Kessel Crane gear, be sure to check out KesselCrane.com.